Окей. Здраво на сите. Фалден много што дојдовте. Се извинам за овие комбинации. Но моравме тако. После момент решивме дека ќе биде само за една личност и вреден настанот. Добро. Прв пат после февруари 2020, всушност повторно се собираме за настан организиран во рамки на програмата на критичко преиспитување на правото. Мислам, овие две години беа такви какви што беа, ние на почетокот на пандемијата одлучивме дека практично нема да имаме нема да имаме било какви настани, се до дека не не го дочекаме мигот на средба повторно. Овој проект практично така и почна со, со мислам, не беше тоа толку свестен колку што интуитивно веројатно се приклонивме кон кон тоа да создаваме мигови за нашата заедница има любопитни. Тоа не е нашата формална академска заедница и затоа веројатно е фино да се искористи таа позната и потресителна би рекла фраза од Блаже Конецки дека сме дораснати за мигота бедни за дните. Критичко преиспитување на правот е проект кој што не е ни проект, туку е некакво здружување независно. Започнува 2017 година, го започнавме заедно јас, професорот Фрчковски и Ена Речиновска Пандела на, на, на правниот факултет со идеја да се понуди нешто што, што е поинако или отаде официалниот корикулум на, 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 на тој факултет. Од тогаш организиравме околу 12 настени со околу 16 луѓе, тоа не е некоја посебна бројка за пофалба, но од друга страна претот не е нито институционално, нито, нито финансиски поддржан. Тој се базира практично на добра волја, на солидарност, на помош од пријателите. Меѓу нив, несомнено, се музејот, каде што се наоѓаме вечерва, Хотел Парк. Нашите пријатели и лични и формални институционални Хилсиншкиот комитет за човекови права и коалиција Маргини и нормално луѓе кои што во после момент вика да бе, нема проблем, како например Стефан Богевски вечерва кој што ќе не фотка. Така да, тоа е тоа од прилика. Немам нешто посебно да кажам околу претот, не сум сигурна дали треба сега да посебни некои изјави пред новото нормално да, да, да правиме за да се иницираме во него. Се надам само дека едноставно ќе се среќаваме на малку поредовна основа отколку не знам, следниот, не знам, ноември. Тоа е тоа. Се само кратко, јас не би се осудила да, како да кажам, да да раскажам што може би ние вечер ке слушнеме. Интуитивно само ке советам да предскажам. Би сакала само да напоменам една работа, а тоа е дека со Ион Чемберс заедно работиме на една еден друг проект, кој се дека геофилософија на правото. На, се извинам, ужасна грешка. Да, геофилософија на Балканот. Скопскиот тим кој е вклучен во тој, во тој проект го сочинуваме јас, Славчо Димитров, професорот Фрчковски и Годен Георгиев. Заедно со пријатели од Верона, од Неапол, од Атина и Белград се обидуваме да дизајнираме трансдисциплинарна MA и PhD програма за студии за Балканот. Тоа е еден возбудлив процес и така некако и ем практично и се доближи до, нас, до нашите простори. Ион Чемберс има поетичен израз. Тој се измолкнува на тоа што и самиот го нарекува невиност на философскиот дискурс, со тоа што го разводенува јазикот и така се заобразува со други форми, како, например, со звукот и со сликата. Имено форми кои што не одговараат само на логосот, туку в сушност и на сетилата. Во таквиот поетичен склад и незнеговата работа проникнуваат неколку фигури, ја би издвоила три, тоа се колониалната разлика, миграцијата и мислењето со. Некако преку него сватив дека е многу возбудливо кога една друга географија, например таа на водата или морето, 
станува централен означувач или воопшто се наметнува како место што ги прекршува значењата. И сега во таа смисла наменување на агрегатната состојба на критичката мисла, кога тоа веќе не е стабилното копно, тука е нешто што истекува и се менува односно е водата. Сакала само еден краток цитат од Франк, Франко Касано од Медитеранска мисла, темплум, веле 12-та, да прочитам. Не може да се размислува за полис без немирот и целокупната верност која се раѓа од војната природа на оние што живеат на брегот. Без морето, моките ризикува веднаш да стане собственост на деспотот или философите, без крајността на хоризонтот што ја создава морето истовремено спречува знаењето во било кој облик да се укотви во една дефинитивна мисла и моките веднаш да се вкорени во неподвижността на личната собственост. Философијата во Грција се срекева со својата причина, но и со своето ограничување. Открива дека е дел, од нешто што ја предходи и што ја објасни. Се би се вратила на тие три а, а, фигури, кои што само кратко ќе ги навестам. А, па така, нели, истекувањето или поинаквата агрегатна состојба на мислата за нашата современост ни овозможува, ни помага да бидеме помалку вознемирени а, од сознанието дека постојат други хоризонти, друг говор и мапи кои допрва ќе се растегнат. Колониалната разлика и морето како кајнезин сведок кај Чемберс упатува на постојањето на страшни просторно-правни пейсажи или номоскейпс, во кој е видлива продукцијата и репродукцијата на разликата, она разлика која исклучува, структурите на маргинализација и привилегии. Тоа се пейсажи на населен номос. Втората фигура на миграција или мигрантот, странецот, Чемберс не ја третира како историски симптом на модерноста, повеќе заговара дека станува збор за истреен и збиен опит на вистинскиот идентитет на денешниот политички субјект. Неговата или анизината потрошност, или потрошност на мигрантот или странецот, е исто така и наша, исто и моја, бидеќи ги открива координатите на световната состојба во драм, драматичната итност на нашиот секојдневен живот и нормално арбитрарното насилство што во него постои. Покрај неговата или незината потрошност и нивната сила е моја, таа сила на мигрантот или странецот, таа го открива животот кој сака да преживеен из различни можни форми и поважно, животот е постојано во надоаѓање. Него, странецот или мигрантот, ветрот го носи. Тоа е една а, трогателна а, изјава на, на а, градоначалникот на едно мало место во Калабрија, на Ријаче, Доменико Лукано. Тоа е сега осуден на 13 години затвор, затоа што заедно со неговите сужители, со, не, со мигрантите и странците кои стигна во Ријаче и со кои што тој го изгради практично најуспешниот модел на политика на гостопримство, тој така изјави за, за неговите нови сограѓани, сужители, нив ветрот ги донесе. Конечно, последната фигура или мислењето со е гест со кој Чембарс се обидува да бара и наоѓа критички пракси во звукот, визуално поле и воопшто се што може да открие други јазици, да создаде екологија на знаењата, да го прошири просторот на епистемологијата и одеднаш да почнеме да зборуваме за епистемологија, дори онакви на југот. Значи, се што ќе обозможи разбирање на светот, и тоа не со наследени еднозначни категории, туку со распространување на знаењата и означувачи што ги пронижуваат нашите тела, но не само, туку го пронижуваат и минералниот жив свет, растителниот, морскиот, молекуларниот и животинскиот. Последно, Иан Чембер се нежен и внимател на архивар на цели светови, судбини и форми на живот. Тој критички ги истражува постојните мапи, но навестува дека има нови и поинакви кои што се веќе на дофат. Ние би рекла го имаме задоволството сега тој да ја отвори мапата на Балканот, но токму во фигурата на мислење со. Тој се обидува во последните неколку негови текстови да го мисли Медитеранот со Балканот. И јас се надавам дека делот тоа и вечерва ќе го и следиме. Тоа е тоа. Иен, 
Ti ringrazio tanto. Thank you very much. The floor and the Balkans are yours now. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. And uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who organised this uh, evening's event uh, for the invitation to come here and for the hospitality. Uh, it's the first time I've been, I have been in Skopje, um, so thank you. So I'm going to try and talk this evening about the, what I call here the edges of history, the Mediterranean as a laboratory of modernity. And I'm going to talk about it in, <coughs> as an invitation to rethink the Mediterranean by introducing uh, other coordinates as opposed to those that are normally employed by um, European historians or sociologists uh, or even anthropologists. Uh, and I'm going to try um, and suggest they may help, they may help uh, as Vicky was mentioning, uh, to uh, repropose some of the uh, coordinates for rethinking the Balkans uh, in a manner which takes them out of the usual European framing where they're considered to be marginal to the history of Europe, uh, perhaps inside, perhaps outside of Europe, uh, and to try, so by rethinking the Mediterranean, uh, to insert the Balkans into that s space as an emergent critical space, which perhaps allows us to see other things which are more institutional accounts and histories and politics. Uh, when they talk about the, the Balkans, fail to hear or fail to uh, see. So I'm gonna, obviously it involves a question about um, talking about uh, the power of maps, uh, thinking how the Mediterranean has been mapped, particularly how it's been mapped uh, and framed over the last 200 years by overwhelmingly by the gaze, critical gaze, political gaze, cultural gaze that arise from the northern shore, from the European shore of the Mediterranean, which is in many ways reproposed the Mediterranean in the classical uh, terms of the Roman Empire's Mare Nostrum, and it's RC. So it's uh, our, in terms of us Europeans, it's our right to legislate, uh, to f explain it, to map it, to narrate it. Which of course raises all sorts of questions uh, politically and culturally about who has the right to narrate, who has the right to narrate the Mediterranean. Uh, so the right to narrate is, allows us to understand how maps are never neutral, because who has the right to, nar to narrate is who has the right to map, who has the right to map the world. Um, so it immediately raises questions about apparently the uh, neutral understandings of, or scientific understandings of what we call geography, uh, sociology and historiography, because clearly maps are exercises in power. Maps are exercises in the power to map and to narrate and to explain. Uh, and tied to that then is of course the idea that history, history is always now. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interruption or an interrogation of the usual historical accounting of the Mediterranean which tends to propose it in a very linear fashion, uh, apparently disciplined by the development of progress through time whereby our Mediterranean, the European Mediterranean, is the only one that counts as the dominant or hegemonic narrative and the other Mediterraneans that may have exist, existed in the past are not allowed to uh, impinge or interrupt or interrogate our understanding. Uh, and what I'm going to suggest by insisting what the idea of history is now, that is history, the act of historiography, the act of writing, of configuring uh, the past, is always a contemporary act. It is always a contemporary act, and by insisting upon that, suggesting that past, that complex past, with its histories and cultures, does not pass, but continues to reside or ghost uh, in the present, continues to interrogate uh, and interrupt the dominant narratives in the present. So who has the right to narrate? Who has the right to... Um, to uh, has also tied to contemporary questions, thinking about migration, the centrality of migration, the so-called illegal migration, illegal because European legislation has decided, has framed the migrant, uh, his or her history, his or her body, as being illegal and external to uh, Europe, Europe, even though, of course, this is um, Europe and the West refusing to uh, recognize or refusing to acknowledge any, any longer the 1947 Declaration of Human Rights, which guaranteed everybody has the right to migrate. This is no longer recognized by any West. So who has the right to migrate uh, is also tied, who has the right to decide who lives and who dies? Who has the right to decide who lives and who dies? So Mary Nostrum, which becomes also the site of the necropolitics, that is, and this is a, one of these uh, typical maps showing how uh, the Mediterranean is managed solely from the, solely from the northern shore 
by European powers, uh, military powers, economical powers, political powers, uh, juridical powers. And here it's showing those uh, death by rescue, those who are rescued and those who are left to die. Which is all a creation from European power, the power to map and to explain and manage the Mediterranean. So the idea then is the migrant, the, the arrival of the migrant today, say from uh, Africa, sub Saharan Africa, or from the so called Middle East, these are all concepts, of course, which were elaborated by European modernity, things like the Middle East, the European invention, and, uh, and that the uh, migrant's body, uh, the uninvited guest, as it were, uh, comes from the past we assumed has passed because what the migrant brings with on with her her or his body is if you like the opening up of that past the return of that past that is uh, the return of the past which underlines and emphasizes the colonial constitution of the present the colonial constitution of the present so again that past which does not pass but continues to uh, interrogate interrupt our present so the colonial past, despite our historicism and the positivism of our measure of time, does not pass. So again, this idea of changing the coordinates, reintroducing those past, the colonial constitution of the present, not as, as a separate chapter back there, but as a continual uh, force in the making of the present, uh, suggests that there's a modernity of work, a modernity of work, but it's not simply ours. When I say ours, I'm referring to Western Europe or the, the West, how it has... Um, is managing the world uh, today. So there are, in a way, uh, we'd like to say, we could say there are deeper rhythms that compose the space-time of the Mediterranean, deeper rhythms, uh, not simply, and, and this means, it's not simply about reintroducing uh, past histories and cultures back into the picture, remembering that two-thirds of the Mediterranean is composed um, by its African and Asian shorelines, it's not simply about recovering that, let's say, the Islamic past, the Arab past, uh, and bringing that back into the picture. It's more, uh, so it's not a question of adding the forgotten, uh, but rather uh, an invitation to uh, proposing a radical reconfiguration of the Mediterranean in the light of the histories of the present history, the hegemonic history, has found necessary to, re to repress, to ignore, in order for its accounting of time space to pass as being unique and universal. So it's about disturbing uh, and unraveling, unraveling that hegemony with these unauthorized questions, which means, of course, also crossing the existing disciplines, existing formation of Occidental knowledge, whether in historiography, sociology, or whatever, with unauthorized questions, which is a bit what, uh, the, what I come out of, uh, my own formation in cultural and post-colonial studies is about that. And cultural studies is not really a discipline, it's about a, a manner, a style, a modality of crossing existing, existing disciplines with these unauthorized questions, which invites us to rethink the very premises that make the world, you know, narrates the world in a particular fashion that excludes uh, other ways of narrating. Uh, so, uh, if the Mediterranean has uh, become, at the same time, a contemporary hotspot, a global hotspot because of migration, the massive, massive migration from the south, the different souths of the world uh, into, into uh, the north, um, <clears throat> it's also become a contemporary hotspot thinking about migration alongside questions of the revolts and revolutions uh, in North Africa and the Middle East since 2011, 2012. Um, but the, the point here is that when we talk about migration or we talk about the revolts and rebellions and revolutions in North Africa and the Middle East, it, what I'm trying to uh, point to is how we can refer to these processes and events almost exclusively in, in our terms. We exclude the actors, we exclude their voices. So when we talk what happened in, in Egypt or, uh, in 2011, 2012, it's always measured against um, a European template. What is, it, what is revolution? How does, how does Europe historically uh, define revolution? And it's measured against that. Rather than thinking about how what's happening or what has happened, perhaps changes the coordinates of the languages or understands in what are revolutions as processes and not simply as fixed events in time. Like 1789, or the American Revolution <coughs> in 1776, so on, but as processes which also put in question our language and our understandings and our templates of what constitutes change, radical change, revolution, and so on. And this, uh, if you like, uh, I suppose it uh, emphasizes and uh, underlines what would, when we talk about these other areas or we talk about others, uh, and this will come back, I'll come back to something 
talk about the Balkans when I, or when Western Europeans talk about the Balkans, is to register the asymmetrical relationships of power. Again, who has the right to narrate, to explain, uh, to consider what is a revolution or radical process, uh, and so on. So the asymmetrical relations of power exclude the idea that there are multiple reasons uh, for the rights to migrate, multiple reasons for the rights to migrate, that the migrant is not external to modernity, but is internal. Uh, his or her imaginary has been formed within uh, modernity. Um, the right, all that the processes and procedures of revolution can only respect the Occidental template. Who says that's the only way to change for radical social and political change? has to go through the processes that have been registered in the West as being uh, revolutionary. Uh, uh, and uh, so it just means to touch, if you like, deeper ribbons and deeper tempos that do not necessarily respect a single score or, or unique narrative. That is, do not simply respect our narrative. So, um, and this uh, remains, here we are in the Eastern Mediterranean. This, of course, is a map of what was then the Ottoman province of Palestine. Uh, the name's written um, in, a, and certainly not written in English or French, but are written in Arabic. Uh, and of course, you know, the whole colonial uh, appropriation of the Mediterranean, which begins around 1800, the arrival of Napoleon uh, Bonaparte's troops in Egypt in 1798, uh, the systematic appropriation of other people's territories, the renaming, the process of renaming, cancelling existing names to rename it, in order to take possession, uh, through mapping, through maps which are not simply neutral devices for appropriating territory, but uh, signal the idea of appropriation in a totalizing fashion. That is, uh, it's brought in, other people's uh, territories are brought into European culture, are emptied of their previous cultures to be then filled with the history of progress, that is, history, the history of, of, the, of the West. So, uh, this. Uh, and this is, of course, the shift between what was that and this, which is, of course, the 1920s and the so-called Middle East, when the Middle East was invented, constructed, because it was halfway between London and Delhi, Middle East, as opposed to the Far East, uh, and the construction of the modern nation-states, other European concepts, nation-states, such as the nation-states of uh, Syria, Lebanon, <coughs> uh, Iraq, and 1948, the foundation of the State of Israel. Uh, so, to see how these, again, that maps are never neutral, but are historical configurations and exercise of power. Uh, and I think that's something we could talk about, thinking about the situation here as well. Um, but what, it, what I'm trying to insist upon here is, is the colonial constitution of identity. Not that colonialism is a, a chapter that occurred in the past, and now we've got past that, we've got beyond that but that it continues to constitute our understandings of the present so that the Mediterranean itself continues to be a colonial space, not only in 1798 or in 1920 with the arrival of the division uh, and creation of the Middle, Middle East between French and British forces, but today as well in the management of its economically, politically uh, and military as, as well. <coughs> so. Uh, and it was, this is a, an, another example, right? the continuing, uh, our continuing white settler, white set, settler occupation, in this case in Palestine, um, and in the state of Israel going on today, and that, which also points to the whole difficulties that people have, particularly in the United States, which is another white settler col uh, colony, in uh, dealing with the question of Israel, uh, blocked by the question of the Holocaust, but not working through and working beyond that. Uh, to think about the whole questions of a white settler colonial state um, and what that implies in terms of colonialism, racism, apartheid, uh, which continues to operate in the creation of white, so, uh, white settler colonialism in, in Israel as the emptying of the land of its previous occupants in order for it to be occupied by, again, an occidental narrative. Um, so, um, and then, okay, we can jump over that. So uh, then there's the, uh, so this, what I'm just further is then the migration, as I say, opens these archives, um, opens these unauthorized archives. So it's not simply a, an economical phenomenon occurring in the margins of modernity, migrants who try to get in and be part of, of modernity, but perhaps to begin to think about uh, migration is the story, is the history of modernity itself. The migration is not something that began two or three decades ago, 
but is actually been central to the making of modernity for 500 years, for 500 years, from the moment that Europe sought to uh, migrate and occupy territories overseas and elsewhere. Um, to the massive migrations of Europeans in the 19th century, to the Americas, Australia, and so on, uh, and to the present day migration where it's occurring today, and also, of course, within that history, the massive migration, forced migration of black Africans as slaves to the Americas from uh, 1500 onwards. So these are different chapters in a shared narrative, a common narrative, which modernity, uh, which migration is central to the making of modernity. So this means, as I've written here, reopening the archive. Uh, if we could talk about the Mediterranean as an archive, even, it's, even in terms of its waters, uh, in its waters we find archives which are sustained and suspended in the bodies that cross it and also the bodies that don't manage to cross it, but uh, are left to die in it. Uh, their bodies are telling a history, uh, are actually forms of archives which reopen an understanding of identity, <coughs> proposing other ways to uh, appropriate and understand it, the making of identity. So reopening the archive, unwinding history, uh, in the sense that it's not fixed in a linear fashion, but we can move back and forward in time, in the space time, the Mediterranean, to touch these archives, to bring into, que to bring into play other questions that the dominant linear narrative is not uh, listened to, uh, and to play it again, to play it again. So rewinding, unwinding history and playing it again to challenge the Occidental clock and its colonization of time. Um, which leads to the idea of, it, of emergence also of other critical languages uh, that permit us to better travel into the question. What I mean by that, by other critical languages, um, is, um, and this again is something which uh, is a way of sowing uh, unauthorized questions in the usual uh, framing um, of the Mediterranean and the framing of modernity itself, which is normally talked about in terms of neutral scientific languages, uh, is to uh, complicate that and in a way um, which um, can be happen can occur, for example, we think about the visual arts, or we think about music, but again, to think about these languages not simply as illustrations of historical processes occurring elsewhere, that the visual arts represent uh, historical processes occurring elsewhere, but to think about them as critical languages in their own right. So uh, thinking about music, because uh, music travels, uh, well beyond linguistic boundaries or national boundaries. It permits us to move, uh, move with sound uh, and to chart and map a very different Mediterranean following the sounds. Very different Mediterranean from that proposed by the simple addition of national histories one to the other, for example, the history of Spain to history of Italy to history of Greece and so on, as though that's the history of the Mediterranean. Uh, the sounds permit us to remap it, to map it in a way which exceed the uh, linguistic and national and European framings of the question. <coughs> so it allows us to travel, if you like, in, um, in um, transnational, in transnational uh, and uh, interdisciplinary space. So this idea, again, uh, d d before moving further into that, this again is to show this argument about history is now. History is always now, as Walter Benjamin put it. Um, so in the top left-hand corner, but that image there, that's the, arrival, that's the Battle of the Pyramids in 1798, the French troops were de defeating Egyptian forces in the, what was then the province, one of the pro provinces in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and below we have the, the creation of the Middle East between the British and French uh, mandates, <coughs> where, and what would then be later the creation of the new nation states, as I've already said. And here on the left, we have this young girl arriving from Syria in 2015 on the island of Lesbos, um, which is also tied to a colonial formation. Syria is, uh, again, you know, was created under the French mandate in the 1920s. So to suggest that what's happening in 2015 on Lesbos is not, uh, is, is interrelated, interconnected, entangled with that archive, that deeper history of the colonial constitution of the present. It's not that they're simply separate moments in time, but they're actually a form of kaleidoscope. And we, can, um, we could begin from that young girl arriving on Lesbos and rewrite the history of modernity and the history of the Eastern Mediterranean, for example. Why, does, why is she there? To try and answer the culture and to recombine it uh, in, another, in another way. So, um, as I was saying, this idea of using other languages, uh, like the visual arts, this is a, a still from a, a three-screen video installation by the black British artist Isaac Julian. Uh, it's, 
in 2007. Uh, it's called Western Union Small Boats. Western Union being an agency that people use uh, to send money back to their families, whether in sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere. Um, and in this, in this installation, there's a very beautiful sequence um, which is played uh, in this building. It's a famous palazzo in Palermo, in Sicily. It was used by Lucchino Visconti in the film Il Gatto Pardo, uh, where we see the uninvited guests, that is migrants, in a dance of death on the same, in the same uh, uh, building, on the same uh, ballroom that was used in the Visconti movie where we saw uh, Sicilian aristocrats dancing, and now we see migrants, the uninvited guests, dancing <coughs> in a dance of death in the same space. So the, the idea of the repetition uh, of European gestures, of European art as well. Uh, this Conti film, this is also a very beautifully shot uh, video installation, through the repetition, the release of another history, of an unauthorized history, an, unauf an unauthorized telling of the tale of modernity from below, from elsewhere, from the margins as it were. So, uh, uh, and there's a similar thing here. This is from uh, an Ethiopian Italian director, Dagmawi Yimma. Uh, this is called uh, uh, Names, you know, Azmat in Tigrina. And it's trying to give names to those who die at sea, uh, who those who died at sea trying to cross the Mediterranean. Uh, trying to uh, give them a voice, as it were, and forcing us to listen, forcing us to listen to the but basically all you hear are these names being repeated as they arrive from the sea, from the depths, from this cemetery, this liquid cemetery, uh, and forcing us to listen, making us listen. And in the listening, as you know, through sound, because the other thing about sound is that sound returns. It's not like in simply representation, which tends to involve the visual hegemony of us as subjects who are looking towards infinity, able to control the field of vision and then frame everything and explain it. But sound is a return where we have voices that have not been authorized by our subjective control of the field of vision. So in the sound of these names, uh, there's an interruption of our vision, of our way of representing uh, and organizing the field of knowledge. Um, Again, this is, a, this is a fantastic artist from Algiers. Um, this is from a, an exhibition in the 1950s, which was, sold, it was supposed to have inspired Picasso. But what interests me here is, uh, is this primitive art or is it modern art? And the, the, and, uh, the, the, the difficulty of uh, <coughs> defining it, the difficulty of giving a definition is what is interesting. It creates that split, that gap in the simple linearity of time and the accounting of time, primitivity, modernity. This is highly modern and or primitive, it doesn't matter, but it's posing as, the fact that you can pose those questions suggests there is no, it's impossible to insist on a single uniform or homogeneous modernity. There are different ways of being uh, in this, in it. Um, okay, so, to conclude, this is an example for music, of course.
حذرا من الجبل which is again an invitation to uh, think whose Mediterranean is it? Um, perhaps it does not exist in Arabic Mediterranean. In fact, the Arabic word Mediterranean only entered, became, entered Arabic in the beginning of the 20th century. So to, uh, at least to understand there are other gazes, other ways, other ways of configuring the Mediterranean, other histories that have crossed it, uh, with other perspectives in, in mind and, and in practice as well. So, um, I now want to. So it's an idea, very simply, of uh, drawing upon the famous phrase from Joseph Conrad um, that the Mediterranean, at least over the modern Mediterranean, has always been under Western eyes. Um, and I put this quote from his uh, from his fam very well known historian uh, David uh, Abulafia, teaches at Cambridge, um, the Great Sea: uh, A Human History of the Mediterranean. Now, if you read this, it's the opening pages of what is a 600-page volume of the Mediterranean, which goes from prehistoric times, before human existence, right through to the present, explaining, mapping, uh, narrating the Mediterranean. And what we find here, uh, this phrase at the beginning of the volume, which says, the Mediterranean we now know was shaped by Phoenicians, Greeks, and Etruscans in antiquity, by Genoese, Venetians, and Catalans in the Middle Ages, by Dutch, English, and Russian navies in the centuries before 1800. Well, you know, um, let's just say very simply, uh, the Arabs, uh, the Mongols, the Ottoman Empire, which in 1600 was considered the, the, the first power in Europe, the first power in Europe. All that's excluded from this, from this account. You know? um, and the basic is reduced in his history, his telling the, of the history of Mediterranean to marginal military excursions in the making of Europe. In other words, they were not considered to be important components in the making of Europe. Well, I mean, one could, one could in a provocative way say, for example, Islam, um, historically, culturally, is a European religion. It's one of the three monotheisms that constitute the making of Europe. Uh, along, alongside Christianity and Judaism. Uh, Islam has been present in Europe longer in some parts of Europe than Christianity has been in other parts of Europe. I mean, after all, we're going to say that Islam was present in 711 with the arrival of Berber, Berber troops under Arab commanders in Spain. Um, Christianity was uh, not present in uh, the so-called Baltic states until the 12th, 13th century. The, Teutonic, the order of the Teutonic Knights basically uh, conducted all the crusades <coughs> in that part of the world, not in the Middle East, but on the uh, eastern borderlands of what was Germany and Poland, conquering the pagan lands. 
or in Uppsala in Sweden, there was human sacrifice conducted every five years, every seven years, sir, uh, until the 12th century. So, I mean, uh, these are more complicated stories, uh, uh, more complicated understandings of the constitution making of Europe, in which there's no, no, it's, it's much harder to insist there's a simple in, inside and an outside. So, Europe is purely autochthonous creation and not part of a much wider series of uh, processes and developments. And at the same time, in this sort of uh, telling and sort of construction of the Mediterranean, there's no discussion of the problematic nature of colonialism, nation-state formations, imperialism, uh, and the making of both history and the human uh, at all. I mean, these are, these are critical concepts. What do we mean by history? What do we understand by the history, the history writing? This is open to, uh, open to debate. Is history in the sort of Walter Benjamin sense, a constellation in the now, or is it simply this linear narrative where everything is put in place in terms of empirical facts which are not to be questioned? So, to think about that, and uh, what I want to do that by uh, very briefly uh, taking a, a deep, uh, deep dive into the archive. Um, I'm going to do this by it's called Thinking with the Diver, um, Colonization, 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 and White Myths. Uh, this is a famous diver from uh, a tomb, it's called the Tomb of the Diver, which was discovered in 1968. It, you're not, we're not supposed to be seeing this because this was painted on the inside of a sarcophagus, inside of the tomb where the person was buried. Um, so it was, it was painted for invisible eyes, but anyway, it was discovered in 1968 and, and opened. And what do we see here? We see a very dark body, I don't know, perhaps a slave, uh, diving. Uh, so again, this, uh, this opens up questions about uh, the idea of uh, that the Mediterranean, it, also in antiquity, was not simply a uh, homogeneous. Uh, this is an example of Council Pestum, which is uh, about 60 kilometers south of Salerno, in southern Italy. Um, so it comes from the moment of Greek colonization, and the great Greek colonization uh, of the, of the, in terms of in the Western Mediterranean, where, as we know, it's not simply a peaceful affair. It involved occupation, people being slaughtered, people being uh, taken as slaves, uh, customs and rights being imported from Greece and imposed on the local population. So, a form of, uh, so it's colonization. And again, it's um, this idea then of thinking that it was not simply completely separate or different from modern colonization or white or modern settler colonization that has occurred uh, in, in modernity and is still occurring in the Middle East in the case of, of Israel, Palestine. So uh, again, raising these questions which come out of, let's say, a post-colonial understanding of uh, colonization, thinking, trying to listen to subaltern histories, bringing those histories into play. Uh, how about also impacts on how we can understand what happened 2,500 years ago? And it's not simply uh, uh, something which is separated from us in time and simply an archaeological of archaeological interest. It is actually of contemporary critical, contemporary critical and um, political uh, interest. <coughs> and again, which it, um, then again uh, interrupts or interrogates all ideas of uh, neutrality and scientificity which uh, break down into altogether more complicated social and political narratives in understanding the past, present, and possible futures. Uh, and this, you know, this, it, it's, in many ways, it's, it, the, the importance of this figure, this dark figure diving um, inside the tomb, it is also, I mean, it's, it raises all these questions, what I would call about the whitewashing of the past, the whitewashing or the whitening of the past, you know, uh, through Hellen Hellenism of the 18th century, uh, the idea of all the temples in the ancient world were white, uh, which is supposed to, in many ways, reflect a purity of origins, of so-called our origins, Occidental origins, and we know they are all painted, often in very garish uh, colours. So we have the Acropolis in Athens, and underneath it's a reproduction of how it would have been, certainly. And of course, it's touched all things like the, the modern whitening of, of uh, a Palestinian, the Palestinian Jew, Jesus Christ presented as, you know, as a white person, right, or, and so on. Uh, and to, as, as I say, and includes like, things like the cleaning up of the Acropolis, and they become this sort of, so, and how this becomes central to the making of the constitution of modernity, this idea of 
the purity of origins, purity of origins. Uh, so ancient Greece uh, and also the idea of colonialism is nothing. What occurred, occurred 2,500 years ago was just a peaceful story of the expansion of civilization across the Mediterranean, from the Eastern Mediterranean towards the West in the Greek colonies was in, in, instead a much more bloody story about colonization and appropriation <coughs> of other people's uh, territories. Um, and how this becomes central to the making of the modern world, this is a, a set of buildings in Bath, in southwest England, is a classic moment of uh, neoclassicism in 18th century Europe, and so all the, which is uh, all, uh, adopted by all the imperial centers, whether Berlin, uh, London, the White House, the White House, the White House, <laughs> okay, uh, and so on. So uh, to think about how, uh, but it's this vision, this version of the past, of the classical of classical antiquity, which uh, embodies. Uh, is embodied in the contemporary narration uh, and the power, power relations which uh, over determine how we tend to view the past and how we tend to tell the story uh, of the Mediterranean today. <coughs> and this is the Acropolis um, uh, to, over 200 years ago, 250 years ago, when of course there was a mosque inside the Acropolis, uh, which has obviously been removed because uh, what has occurred and is occurring right now in the uh, represent and the cleaning up of the Acropolis to try and permit us to return to the authentic purity of its origins is the removal of any forms of historical sedimentation. So here we are on the way up to the Acropolis and here in the debris we see Muslim tombs that it is taken away. Uh, that stratification of sedimentation of history is taken away so I have an immediate access to uh, the purity of our art. I don't know who his R is, but R origins uh, back there in, 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 ancient, in ancient Greece. Um, so it produces histories, produces histories that deny history. Produces histories that deny history. Um, and of course it's all about you know, white heteronormative <coughs> patriarchies in the end underneath that. <coughs> Now, um, I, I want to uh, conclude with two, um, in two dimensions. I want to say a few words about uh, the Balkans, and I want to play you a piece of music which, again, uh, takes us back to this idea of how certain languages perhaps permit us to travel further into the critical configuration of these questions, as opposed to more institutional forms of knowledge which are always attempt, intent upon, or they believe they can render the world transparent to their will to intellectual and also political uh, power. So I put this section in the Balkan Blues. Um, it's to think about, um, it's to think about, um, it's a question I pose to myself because I don't know much about the Balkans. So I can't talk about it. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, or whatever. But I'm trying to think about how involved in the, pro in the project that Vicky mentioned on the geophilosophy of the Balkans how to be involved in a manner uh, which it does not involve uh, speaking for or in the name of the Balkans. Uh, so trying to, how to understand how it's possible to speak beside or alongside. Uh, and that's why um, this idea of rethinking the Mediterranean, uh, rethinking the coordinates that have made the Mediterranean in a certain fashion under, under a European colonial gaze, it can be useful, I think, to. Uh, thinking how to rethink uh, the Balkans, how to be involved, how I can be involved in a project about rethinking the Balkans. And, and I've already mentioned this here, right? So obviously I have to register uh, thinking about the histories, cultures, lives, bodies that have been excluded from the prevalent or the hegemonic uh, narration of the, of the Mediterranean, bring it back into play, for example, Islam, and the Ottoman world. And again, it's not simply about adding those forgotten histories or adding those marginalized histories. The moment I bring those histories and cultures back into play, I have to rethink the premises of the history of the Mediterranean and the history of the Balkans. I have to rethink the premises in the light of what the dominant the hegemonic history has marginalized or refused to register. So I have to, it's not simply about adding things, it's about reconfiguring, radically reconfiguring and registering. It's also about, I use the word registering because it's also about things I cannot necessarily represent. I cannot necessarily represent, I cannot necessarily bring into my language and render fully uh, transparent to my language. But I begin to hear, listen, and begin to, uh, begin to register. 
So uh, it means to register also my limits, register my limits uh, when talking about the Balkans, or when talking about the Mediterranean, or when talking about modernity, which is not simply mine to, to narrate. Uh, to register my limits rather than exercise the powers of my representation, which are invariably stereotypes. There are very stereotypes, uh, the powers of my representation, when I'm talking about other histories, other cultures. So rather than thinking of the Balkans as an object of study, sociological object, historiographical object, anthropological object, political object, rather than thinking as an object of study or research, seeking to think with its histories, cultures and voices, which implies some idea about a politics of listening rather than simply the politics of seeing, representing, framing, and, read, and putting everything into its place in my field of critical vision. <clears throat> so opposed to ocular hegemony, that is my perspectives, framings, uh, Balkans, to suggest a politics of listening, a return that throws a critical light, and this is our moment insist on this, throws a critical light back upon Europe, back upon the power that named this place, the Balkans, based. I know it's a Turkish name, but as you know, the Balkans as a, as a term has a certain resonance within contemporary or modern European discourse as being something to do with peripheral, something to do with breakup, uh, not yet fully modern, all those things. And to think rather in terms of how uh, that framing of the Balkans by Europe throws a critical light back upon Europe itself. <coughs> So, it throws, uh, and also, so it puts into question the sort of self-assured critical uh, landscapes of nationalisms, and these are all terms invented in Western Europe, democracy and rights. How do we understand nationalisms, democracies and rights? Referring back to what I was saying about what happened in North Africa in 2011-2013. Uh, in Initially, Western press, Western politicians were taken by surprise. They didn't know what to say. And then they brought in the usual conceptual landscape already prepared by the Western understanding. What is democracy? What is revolution? What is it? And so on. So how, what this apparently elsewhere throws a critical light back upon, um, upon Europe itself. So here I discover uh, that concepts such as liberalism and democracy are not so secure. Um, today, illiberal e e -liberal regimes are not restricted to the eastern and southeastern part of Europe. Just look at the broken democracies right now in the United States of America and the UK. Those are broken democracies, my friend, broken democracies. So to think about, when we talk about democracy, uh, liberal institutions, <coughs> human rights, how it's a much more complicated web. I can throw a critical light back upon those who consider themselves to be uh, have the uh, authority to define, define those terms. Uh, we can talk more about that if you want. Uh, and uh, so this idea about changing the uh, conceptual coordinates and those at space time, I want to end on a sort of optimistic note um, through music. <coughs> I want to play you um, a piece which lasts about six or seven minutes, and that's it. Um, and suggest that in the sounds we're going to hear now, there are archives are sustained in these sounds uh, that, uh, again, permit us to go beyond the sort of usual linguistic nationalist <laughs> framings uh, and propose other narratives uh, where the past continues to interrogate the present, uh, proposing, if you like, uh, other futures, suggesting other futures. So we're going to see this sequence where there's two groups of musicians, a group of Sufi musicians from Egypt, uh, and a group of flamenco musicians, and they're playing in a, uh, an old or disused monastery, uh, a monastery uh, in southern Spain. And, uh, and of course, they're reactivated in all the archives. You know? Spain, flamenco music, when you think about it, it was a country up, a country up, super, immediately Spain. Uh, but of course, you can't understand flamenco music without thinking, understanding the centrality of Islam, Arab music making, or also Jewish music making, to the making of the sound of flamenco. Uh, and the musicians playing together, the sort of south and north, the sort of south, the southern shore of the Mediterranean, northern shore of the Mediterranean, east and west, Egypt, Spain, 
and how all these are occurring in the present, in the present. So a, a reconfiguration, a reconstitution of the languages of modernity. And the archives apparently come from the past. At the same time, uh, proposing other ways of constituting uh, and understanding the composition of the present, and with it indicating perhaps other possible, other possible uh, futures. Okay.